I used to be afraid of attending networking meetings. I didn't know how to talk to people about my business. I was just afraid and didn't know what to do. I reluctantly went to a networking meeting one time and learned that the leader was a Toastmaster, Cleon Cox, and he was saying about the benefits of joining this club called Toastmasters. I went to a club near my home. It turned out to be a safe place where I could practice impromptu speaking. It was the best thing for me because these networking meetings, you meet different people from all walks of life. Practicing impromptu speaking every day allowed me to develop confidence in myself. Also, the people are supportive and encouraging, and we have fun. Thanks to Toastmasters, my business is now booming. I'm not afraid to walk up to anyone and start a conversation. Hi, welcome to TV Toastmasters. I am your host today, Kathy Armias. And I have with me today, Mitra Shari. I am so excited um, to talk to Mitra. Mitra, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you about your life. Um, you know how you, you meet these people in your life and you're like, wow, I just cannot, my brain doesn't comprehend some of the things that you've been through and the journey that you've been on in your life so far. So I kind of want to take the audience on this journey with you. So you grew up, you were born in, and raised in Iran, is that right? Correct. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, I'm almost 60 years old, so we're talking about 60 years ago in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, that was during Shah's time, so it wasn't as oppressed as it is today, but still the mentality was um, 60 years ago right, right. <laughs> in Iran. <laughs> yeah. um, I was born to a family with two brothers, and my, bro uh, my father was in his sports, so he treated pretty much all three of us like a boy, which was great. Um, I, when I was in my teens, I started playing basketball, which is something girls didn't play sports in Iran. But I was able to do that because my mom pretty much wanted me out of the house, so she was happy that I was doing something else. <laughs> and I, of course, boys don't want, like to play with girls. And I had to learn to do something very good, and that was to make the basket. And the only way I could do that as a girl, because nobody would give you the ball, is to steal it, run really fast, and then go to the three point with, on the side and do a sky hook shot. <laughs> and I practiced that for over a year, just that one shot. Because as my animal spirit, Bruce Lee said, mm. I am not afraid of a man who knows 10,000 kicks. I'm afraid of a man who knows one kick but has practiced it 10,000 times. Mm. So that really stuck to me, and that's why I mastered that hook shot. And before you know it, boys, not only they weren't laughing at me, they weren't even noticing that I was a girl. I love that. So when, when you first told me to play basketball, I was like, wow. And you know, me, I've, I'm a woman and, and played in sports in the United States, actually. And even just, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it wasn't that great for women in sports. And so this is, uh, that what, when you told me that, that was one of the first things I was like, wow, that's an impressive. And so here you are, like what, what'd you say you're 5'2", 5'3"? Five 5'3". Two? Five three? Five three, <laughs> five three? Yeah. And you have this like three point hook shot. <laughs> I love it, that's fantastic. Um, that, so tell me a little bit more about Iran. So you, did you end up, so your dad was a coach too, did he coach basketball? Uh, he or? was director of sports uh, for uh, Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So he was well connected in the sports, he was the head. Um, so that actually allowed me, to, uh, in the late 70s, allowed me to move to the United States and actually play basketball, college ball. So is that how you got into the United States? You were uh, Well, actually, uh, back then, you could just get a visa and come yeah. for a student visa, and that's what I did. So you came to play basketball uh, at the collegiate to go level? To finish high school, yeah. um, because I really didn't study. In mm. the, I, I had dyslexia. Nobody knew that, so they thought I was dumb. Mm. So it was great, because <laughs> they, didn't make, they didn't expect me, like my brothers, to be straight A's. So I just played basketball, and that was my life, and it was I loved it. And then when I came to the United States, I had to finish the last uh, semester of high school to get my high school diploma before I go to college. And I went to Wichita State University 
and I was on varsity basketball, and then I got drafted into Wichita State University basketball team. Oh my gosh, that is incredible. I know, and that's when I learned a new move. Uh, oh, you learned a second move. Yeah, <laughs> it's bench warmer. Oh, <laughs> bench warmer, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a tough move. Yeah, because apparently by playing with boys who wouldn't give me wouldn't pass the ball to me. I've learned to just steal the ball and make the basket, but I learned in America that basketball is a team sport. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, that little, there's that little <laughs> component to that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, but what, what, what an experience. So, I mean, these things are all life lessons, right? You, you, oh, yeah. You, you figure out you're in Iran, and you're like, well, I have to figure out how to play, and i got to make it happen, and then you make it happen, and then you come to the United States and, and realize that, that, did, that what worked there didn't, well, didn't doesn't translate work and didn't work exactly here. yeah yeah so uh, so you ended up you ended up Wichita State and you graduated did you end up playing basketball the whole the whole time I, I played ba pick up basketball all the way to when I came about 18 years ago when I came to Oregon I actually at one point I was the captain of Oregon trial lawyers uh, team so they have a team oh yeah <laughs> that is so great I love yeah that. I think a lot of defense firms and law schools play with each other. So let me pull out for a minute because mm -hmm. you're now a lawyer. Th that's where this is right. heading. And um, you, you head up Mitra Law Group, which mm -hmm. is awesome. And, and you work mostly on um, employment law, right? Yes, sexual, sexual harassment, harassment and specifically discrimination. and yes. discrimination, yeah. right? And actually my journey started when I went um, to college. I graduated as a medical technology. And it was a great career. And I actually specialized in tissue typing transplantation. And I did the first baby baboon heart transplant testing mm. in, at Loma Linda, which kind of got me introduced to California. And I fell in love with Santa Monica. And I worked for an affiliate, UCLA affiliated lab, research lab, mm -hmm. uh, for a few years. But as much as I was good at my job, it just didn't spark fire in me. So when um, fortuitously a friend of mine who had gotten into law school dared me to go to law school, because he thought I didn't speak English well enough and that I had an accent I couldn't, someone like me could never go to law school, let alone be a lawyer, um, basically dared me to go to law school. So of course, you know, I only know one thing, raising with two, bro you know, growing up with two brothers, I had a special relationship with theirs, I always took them. <laughs> so needless to say, um, I went to law school with every intention to just get in and drop out later just to prove my point. Wait, so you became a lawyer on a dare. Absolutely. <laughs> so you won the dare. <laughs> and I had no intention, aspirations, or desire. Oh. Or even, frankly, between you and I, even thought I could. Yeah. But I figured one semester I would shut them up and move on because right. I had to win. And <laughs> in law school, I tell you, I found my myself i mm. found a niche in life and that's what i've been apparently searching for what drew you what drew you there what was the what was the thing that drew you it so was much? it was as if my brain was on fire i just mm. couldn't get enough i actually wrote the paper why law school should be five years instead of three years because there were so <laughs> many subjects i just wanted to learn. learn more about and there i was someone who supposedly couldn't speak english you know yeah. and that i was supposedly stupid there I was kicking butt in law school because I actually think in law. Law has its own language. Mm. And I literally, everything in law makes sense to me. Right. Where in law school, I had a dictionary trying to figure out the English. I had trouble with the English, mm -hmm. but not with the law concepts. And then within a year, it was like I was speaking fluent law. Fluent law. Oh my gosh, and I, I love just, that. I feel like I... I had so much fun in law school where everyone was struggling. It was great. And when I graduated, I worked for a defense for a couple of years. And I realized that defense, you really don't have a choice what kind of cases you take. You have to defend all kinds of choices. And some of them were not on the right side. Mm. And that just didn't sell well with my soul. Yeah, yeah. So I switched and I started my own firm. And I started doing first medical malpractice. But then I had a sexual harassment case that just lit me on fire. And I just, it was the greatest experience in my life. And after that, that's about became my life. Isn't it funny? It's like, it's like you set out to find your purpose, but your purpose kind of finds you a little that's bit. That's true. Right? And just, it's just sometimes maybe being aware. Right? And I think you just have to be open to things and expose yourself to different yeah. Um, I think one of the problems is we get to either 
go to school in a major that we thought would be good, or our parents push us, or society pushes us. And we get this job, and we've invested too much in it, but we're not happy. Mm -hmm. And we keep thinking with more time, things will be okay, and we'll make ourselves busy other ways. Partying, drinking, having friends, and just basically distracting ourselves. Whereas if we just took the time and acknowledged that this isn't for us, and then do something different, and I remember as a med tech, I was making really good money because I was in demand, because mm -hmm. I was specialized. And everyone around me thought I was crazy to give up this good income and position to, s to go three years back to school and then start I'm all there. over again. <laughs> and I actually thought to myself, because I was 30 when I went to law school, mm. and I thought to myself, I'm going to be 33 no matter what. Yeah. I can be 33 and be a med tech wearing lab coats with blood stains on them. Or I could be 33 and wear suits and go be to speaking work. Law. Be, be speaking law. Basically go to court. And yeah. it just was a no brainer for me. And people around me were struggling about it. I wasn't. And then when I went to, when I became a lawyer, I, I just feel like it's the greatest profession on earth because honestly, you help so many people. People look up to them. People can make all sorts of jokes they want with <laughs> lawyers, but reality, everybody at one point wish they had a friend who was a lawyer, <laughs> was a lawyer <laughs> or family that's member. Actually, that's a true statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, they're good lawyers, bad lawyers, just like every other profession. Right. But uh, I think lawyers are meant to help, and we do that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be in business. If we yeah. couldn't help people, we would not be in business. Yeah. Well, I love, too, that you took the route of helping people. Like, you even, even within law itself, you found the space that was there to help people. And you, and you shied away from the kind of law that was defending people that weren't maybe innocent or weren't in a space. So I love that too. It, it's kind of, it's one of those things when you look in hindsight and you look and you kind of know what you were destined to be because it's kind of inside of you. Right. So and what was I your big, yeah. No, I was gonna say, what was your biggest lesson through that whole like going to school, coming out, starting a profession, going back like you, you were telling me before. Well, I think one of the problems that throughout my life, and I'm sure a lot of women can identify with this, is sexual harassment and mm. being discriminated against and put down because of your gender. If you're strong, they call you a different name. If you're weak, they call you a different name. Um, they make fun of your looks. Everything you know on your body, your size matters. Um, there's just so much, so much coming at women at every given time. You go to work, you either have to put up with stuff, ignore it, or when you complain, they push you out of the company. So we just go through so much. And it's kind of rarity to find someone who hasn't been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed, or some horrific thing. And we just kind of sh shrug our shoulder and move on. But that pisses me off. Mm. And then on top of it, the discrimination that I felt like was unnecessary, but a bunch of people uh, during Iranian hostage crisis, as if I was the cause of it. Um, that just really upset me. And even though I didn't do anything about it, but still, you know, you feel like everybody cracks you, uh, takes something away from you. And I think all of that hurt, looking back, was the greatest thing that could have happened because it just made me such a better lawyer. Because, man, when I mm. kick butt, it just, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and it just feels good. I love that. It's delicious to kick butt. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and this is a great, um, because to our audience, that we're going to come back in a few, but I, uh, we have some great things that we're going to carry on in the second half. So stick with us, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Christopher Taylor, and I'm with TV Toastmasters. My home group is Feedbackers in Beaverton, Oregon. I first joined Toastmasters for a couple reasons. I was nervous. I had trouble speaking in front of others. I needed some help. And when I joined Toastmasters, not knowing what to expect, I learned several things. One, it gave me the confidence to speak in front of others. I learned how to take constructive criticism. I benefited from that. That benefit was the confidence to get a job. When I took the suggestions in the club, when I started speaking in front of a group and remained speaking through my role, doing table topics, getting topics that you're unaware, learning how to th think on your feet, learning how to speak on your feet. 
I first started working managing the Berkshire Hathaway account. I started as a back office role, not the face of the company. It didn't take long until I was dealing directly with the executives. Today I give executive briefings for Verizon Enterprise in the highest level in the enterprise space. And I'm grateful and I owe all of that to Toastmasters. Thank you. Welcome back to TV Toastmasters for our second half with Mitra Shari. Oh my gosh, Mitra. So <laughs> you just ended and, and said that it was delicious to kick butt. What a statement. So I love this. You, you got into this space where you went to school. You came all the way over from Iran. You went to school, started a profession that you made good money in, didn't really like it, and then on a dare, you decided to go to law school for three more years, and you became a lawyer and really found your passion. Congratulations. Thank you. I really want to hear, though, you have a really interesting story, because you were down in the L.A. area at the time, right? Yes, And you I became did. a lawyer. And you have an interesting story about being a lawyer in that space. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, when I switched sides, everyone told me, gave me advice that you should start from working from home and take cases that other lawyers don't want and small cases and work your way up. And that no one starts, I remember this really uh, famous lawyer, no one, Mitra, no one starts at the top. And I just thought, why not? Like in school, they never tell you, hey, start at the F and then work <laughs> your way up to an A. They expect an A, why can't I start from the top? Yeah. So that, I just really, honestly, that did not make sense to me. And I wanted to do multi-million dollar cases because those cases, you have real lawyers on the other side. You don't have some adjuster that you have to just haggle with like your flea market. Yeah. You have real lawyers, le real legal issues, uh, real damages, I mean, you're really protecting someone and fighting hard against some uh, worthy opponent. Yeah. And I wanted that, I was just like really wanted that. Because in school, I, f I, was, I went to the University of Utah and there I was fighting, or I should say competing against people from Harvard, Chicago, undergrad, and they actually had gotten into Harvard Law and their plan that was their plan B and they had gotten into University of Utah. So there were all these great minds and I still made it so I didn't understand what the big deal was so I knew I needed a big office a corner office and um, it's a long story but I managed to get a corner office at basically very little amount because you know big cases require a corner office. A corner office of, of course, course. <laughs> and then as it started I actually got a corner office in one of the first most prestigious um, buildings in Century City. It was called the Sun America. At that time, that was the only high-rise there, pretty much. Um, and that's the hub of entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't have money to hook up phones for a while. I just had secured the office, but I was on notice that I had to, if I had to vacate, it would be 24-hour notice, and that was some part of the terms because mm -hmm. it was an empty office sitting yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And I was going to decorate it. So I actually didn't have money to buy furniture, so I bought home furniture, and I put couches and stuff and made it look very homey. Well, little by little, the word got around that Mitra's office, and I started having wine in my office, and people from the industry, you know, agent type from the industry came, and before you know it, the joking is that I was a casting couch lawyer. I didn't really know what that meant. But very soon I started getting referrals and then I had to get a phone because people were finding me, <laughs> hey, by the way, how do we get a hold of you? And before you know it, I literally started uh, representing actors, actresses, and people in the movie um, industry that were sexually assaulted, um, all sorts of imagine unimaginable things. Oh my gosh. And I started fighting for him. And honestly, it was like uh, um, firing a fish in, was it, shooting fish in a barrel? Yeah. 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 It was like Harvey Weinstein's were dime a dozen like that. Mm, I bet. I can only so, imagine. Yeah. Wow. I love your mentality. Um, you are somebody that your, your soul is on fire. It, it is amazing. But I love your mentality of like, why not start at the top? Why do people tell you you have to start? Don't let people tell you where you should start or how you know how you should make it. So this is a great lesson for anybody and everybody. And honestly, three months into that office, I got my first case. It took a year and a half of hard school of hard knocks, where I found myself sucking my thumb, crying under my desk sometimes from pain. But you know what? Yeah. A year and a half later, we sold the case for four million dollars. Wow. And after that, 
it was just like the home free. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So wow. So how long were you in that space for? How long did you do? Um, I actually was in that space for two years, but then I needed a secretary area because I was growing. Uh, and then I grew, so I moved out to actually get more offices. And then it was, I was very successful in LA. But unfortunately, when you go after, you know, uh, powerful, famous people, they always want to settle. Mm -hmm. So we ended up basically settling some of it for ungodly amounts. And clients were happy, and my ethical obligations were to my client. And I really couldn't get anyone wanting to be a martyr. <laughs> Mm, and yeah. I don't blame them. So I just, little by little, with every case, I feel like a part of my soul was dying. Even though my pocketbook was growing, I was dying. And then at, in 2000, I think it was 2011. Um, well, actually, what am I talking about? It was right after September 11. So it mm, was 2001. 2001. One, December, yeah. as I packed up, I just, I was done. Because mm. more is just that more. It's actually the more I got, the less I was feeling. So I just packed up, moved to Oregon, and I just never looked back since. Wow. And Oregon's been like, it's the most amazing state. In fact, Oregon is the only state in the nation where I find myself bragging about being Iranian, mm -hmm. just to hide the fact that I'm from California. I <laughs> <laughs> feel like I've got to cover that up just with something. Something <laughs> it actually looks better being Iranian here than California. Than California. That is that is actually a true statement too. That's uh, that's good. So how long did you? So when you came up here, were you? So you just stayed in that space of practicing the same kind of law? Were yeah, you in, I was the in sexual harassment? And yeah, I did sexual exclusively. And I actually was pretty well known as the casting couch lawyer, and but nobody wanted to litigate. Yeah. So everything was just get the case. And, and you obviously it. are somebody that has fight in you. You wanted yeah. to fight. And I think that's what was killing yeah. me. Yeah. It's like you're settling a bunch of cases, making money, but your soul felt like it was kind yeah. of. Yeah. And I actually yeah. left on a trial. I tried the case, and we got close to eight hundred thousand dollars, and that's what ignited me. I want more of this. Yeah. Yeah. Kinda. And. So uh, did you know somebody in Oregon or did you just? I actually came here for a three day, uh, you know, visit a friend. Um, and I remember it was July. I was just going to say, I was, was just going to say, you came in July. I didn't did. You? That's and how I everybody remember, comes to Oregon. I walked down the river place and I think the most shocking thing was there were no tax. Yeah. So I shopped like crazy because that's what you do in LA. Yeah. And then I went back and honestly, it was as if I had been fallen in love. And I couldn't stop thinking, but it was a place, and then that was very unusual, but it was felt exactly like how when you fall, fall in love with a guy. Mm. That's how I felt, and I could not stop thinking about it. And I just literally, from the time I was here, time I packed up and came, it was less than three months. I just packed up and left it. I just left. And so then you came up here. Did you have to do anything different? To I, I took the bar. Yeah, I, so you had to take yeah, the bar here Yeah, I took Oregon. the bar. It took like two months to study for the bar. And then I took the bar, and then the results were out in April. And then I started, again, I did the same thing. I go, which building is the nicest? I picked, <laughs> I picked the this coin. This you're like, I think I want to have a phone. Yeah, coin tower. So I started it there, and oh, a corner office, and, you know, just started. I, I know the Mitra way now. The saga I, I know this. Corner office, best you, building, high rise. Oh, well, you I build it. it, they will come. Yeah. Because we, here's the thing. Do you question someone who's in a nice office, gets in a fancy car, or dresses? No, no. you usually You don't. want your lawyer. You actually want your lawyer to look like that. Now, if you were a contractor, you show up in a nice car, expensive you, you wouldn't hire that contractor. Right, that's true, that's so true. Same thing with physicians. You want someone who is successful in order to, you yeah. know, which is kind of not always the right way to go about it, but. It's kind of human nature. It is, yeah, it is. Yeah. Mitra, you're so interesting and so, um, you have so much charisma in you. I, I wish I could talk to you forever, but we're gonna have to wind our time down. But I would love for you to give like, what's one big, like if you take, all the things that you've been through. Tell us like the biggest lesson in life you've learned. Like tell, tell us what, what that would be. Well, I think we all have ways that we can find this power within us. I think we all have it. All of us have it. Everyone has something in their life that they can pull that source and use it as a springboard to be something else that they want to, that would make them happy. However, I think you need to find what sparks this. Everyone, you know, mine might is you dare me. Like for instance, recently I was dared 
that I started doing keynote speaking to spread that y anyone can do anything for female empowerment and diversity. And someone, I said, well, I really want to be like Tony Robbins for women. And someone said, ha, 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 you can never be Tony Robbins. So I thought, my God, Tony Robbins' sob story is like, he didn't have turkey when he was 11. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> and he was a millionaire when he was like 18, 19. That's not a sob story. Yeah. Us women have sob stories. We yeah. have stories inside of me. So now I feel like, OK. So, so that's your new thing. That's you're gonna my be new the, thing. You're going to be the Tony Robbins. Well, I wouldn't so. call it Tony <laughs> Robbins. I will be Mitra. Yeah, I love that. Do you be Mitra? I'll be Mitra. Be Mitra. Mitra, thank you so much. You you are amazing. You're inspirational. Um, keep being you because the world needs you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, for tuning in to TV Toastmasters. I'm your host, Kathy Armias. It's been great. I hope you catch us next time. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Phyllis Harmon. I'm a member of TV Toastmasters. In this club, we have an opportunity to practice speaking before the camera, as well as running the equipment room. If you're interested in being interviewed on TV Toastmasters or becoming a member, please go to toastmasters.org and look for us, or simply search for TV Toastmasters on the web.